Okay, we'll go ahead and reconvene our meeting. Uh, at this point, we'd like to welcome uh, Jeff Voss with the Non-GMO Project and uh, Kirsten Wheeler, also with the Non-GMO Project. Uh, the Non-GMO Project is a nonprofit organization committed to preserving and building uh, sources of non-GMO products, educating consumers, and providing verified non-GMO choices. Jeff Voss serves as a CFO and uh, Chief uh, Operating Officer, and Kirsten Wheeler is the organization's communications manager. So uh, welcome to our meeting. Great to have you here via Skype. Uh, although Thank you. I think it's probably a beautiful day here. I don't I haven't been out for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? We can. Yep. Excellent. Great. Great. Well, I, I appreciate that. And um, um, Chris and I were, were talking uh, last night. And we decided that I would um, I would just hold the mantle for this presentation, um, and uh, she'll she'll correct me um, afterwards on anything that I didn't communicate quite right, but. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to present uh, to the California State Board um, of Food and Agriculture. Uh, and really appreciate it. Thank you for the introduction. So, my name's Jeff Boss with the um, Nanjimo Project. I'm the CEO and CFO. Um, our Executive Director, Megan Westgate, sends her regrets. Unfortunately, was uh, unable to join us. Um, so, I'm hoping to to cover a couple of topics that that we were asked to. Um, provide perhaps a bit of a different perspective on, based on what I've seen on your agenda so far today. Uh, and so a couple of things. First of all, I'll just start by a little bit about the Non-GMO Project story. And, and the reason why that's important is to give you um, a kind of a broader perspective on um, where the need for the Non-GMO Project really kind of came from and um, why the project has been so successful so far in the work that we've done. Uh, we'll then jump right into a really critical part of the conversation, which is about definitions. Uh, and as a standard bearing um, organization that running a verification program, definitions are critical to the work that we do. We want to share a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of consumer perspectives and what the some of the research out there on consumer perspectives around GMOs and new GMOs. And uh, finally, we we're also asked to share a little bit about the regulatory landscape that we're seeing right now. So I hope this will probably take uh, maybe 30 minutes, and then there'll be um, plenty of time for Q&A. Um, I can't see any of you uh, very well. You're very small on my screen, so uh, maybe somebody can help me out if, when we get to the question uh, time. So as was um, read out earlier, uh, this is our, our mission. So to preserve and build sources of non-GMO products, educate consumers, and provide verified non-GMO choices. Um, we do that last thing through our uh, verification program. And many of you are likely familiar with the butterfly logo you see at the top of the screen there. So where did that all come from? So in 2007, the non-GMO project was, was founded by actually a number of U.S. and Canadian retailers, and uh, they started this nonprofit with uh, coming out of real demand from their customers for transparency around GMOs. Um, and this transparency was coming from uh, more awareness around GMO contamination that was happening in the food system of, uh, of uh, non-GMO sources of food. Uh, there were continued long-term health um, concerns and questions about GMOs, uh, really in the longer, on the longer term. So there's some questions. Again, this is where the consumers and, uh, were coming from. And also some level of distrust with big biotech companies. So those factors were kind of coming together where there was this um, interest in, and need for greater GMO transparency. And of course, while many other countries around the world, I mean, there's about 64 countries around the world that that have uh, GMO labeling and regulations, um, the U.S. and Canada did not uh, at, at that particular time. Of course, that just changed uh, recently. The other real need was driven from uh, the need for a standard way of uh, defining and uh, measuring uh, non-GMOs within the food industry. And so 
the, stand, the need for that industry standard really to create a platform for a rigorous and consistent standard um, around the definition of GMOs. And so those two factors came together in the formation of, uh, uh, of the non-GMO project. Um, over the next three years, uh, through public comment periods, uh, work with, with, with researchers and scientists in the field, uh, the development of the non-GMO project standard um, came together. We're now working uh, actually currently on the public comment period on version 15 of our standard. But it, once the standard was, was, version of the standard was finalized, products started coming to market in 2010. And so those were the first products to really carry the butterfly. 2000, fast forward to 2019 now, we're working with over 4,500 brands that produce products that are verified in our program. And there's over $26 billion in sales of non-GMO project verified uh, products. So why is this all important? Well, when we start to look at the, uh, what our mission is in terms of providing consumers with the transparency and with choices, um, you can see this bar chart shows the, the significant growth in the number of products and therefore choices available to consumers uh, in in stores uh, across the U.S. and Canada. And this is reflective of a couple, uh, a couple of key bits of timing, I would say, which is the GMO issue was really coming, um, coming up more and more in the public sphere. There was the, the timing around this and the move for state level uh, GMO transparency initiatives uh, and labeling initiatives like Prop 37 in California, which we were heavily engaged in supporting. Um, a lot of that public interest really started having people paying attention to this issue, and that was about the same time that the butterfly was starting to show up on products, and consumers were starting to engage in this conversation around what matters uh, to them. Um, the other contributing factor is that consumers really started to become more and more interested in what is in their food. You know, and at the end of the day, with our mission, you know, what we really believe is, is that everybody has the right to know what's in their food. Uh, and we think that's something that a lot of people can kind of get behind. So as a result of uh, those factors, you can see here's the growth in the number of products. You know, even today, uh, we were just looking at some research yesterday from 2018 where the LEK consulting, a management consulting firm that did some uh, consumer research around this, uh, you know, came out saying that non-GMO is the, the fastest grow, growing consumer or product attribute um, in, in 2018. So there's more and more people that are um, interested in what's in their food and finding ways of, of engaging with that. And the butterfly, because there are now so many products available, is one way that they're starting to, um, to connect with that. So we're also seeing not only, uh, you know, while we, we initially saw a lot of core natural, uh, natural products and organic products that were getting verified. Um, really, that core has expanded out into um, the non, uh, or the more, let's call it, more conventional uh, shoppers. And so, as well as a broader number and range of products that are available. So we're seeing over the past couple of years, a lot of animal-derived products are now coming in uh, to be verified, and we've done a lot of work with that industry to, to set up really rigorous standards around uh, animal feed and uh, appropriate supply chain um, visibility to be able to trace back from the animal product, from the yogurt container, back to what the, the cows ate um, to pr produce the milk and all the way back up the supply chain. So we see dairy, meat. Um, we're also seeing lots of growth in plant-based proteins um, and wholesale ingredients as well. So getting getting uh, some of many more commodities now being uh, verified as part of a um, feeding into the, the Najimo project verification uh, process and being able to support brands that are looking to make finished products that can get verified quite easily. So this market-based approach is doing two really important things. One is it's helping to change the supply chain, and it's also helping to drive non-GMO innovation um, in food. And I think it's easy to, to be um, excited about this new technology or the new techniques that are being developed. Um, and there's lots of, um, uh, no doubt, uh, amazing uh, potentials in, that, uh, in those new techniques. 
Um, at the same time, I think it's important to remember that food innovation can be happening, has been happening for, for thousands of years, and that there are other ways of um, driving non-GMO uh, food innovation as well. And so we're starting to see more and more of that because of this market-based approach. So um, just a quick bit on how do we fit in our system so that you can kind of understand it. So we are a third-party verification program. We set the standard and the rules. We contract with technical administrators who, uh, who actually work with the client to get the product verified. And then we audit that technical administrator to make sure that they are um, doing the verification uh, at a sufficient level of, of rigor to meet the standard. Um, so if you want to get your, your granola verified, for example, um, you would work with one of these technical administrators. They would evaluate your product. If you have any high-risk ingredients like corn or soy in your product, um, there's additional levels of, of rigor. So we require you to be doing regular and ongoing testing of those products. That's where the testing labs come in. And we also uh, require inspections of your facilities where you process those high-risk ingredients. So this is kind of the, the ecosystem in which uh, we're operating. And of course, we're then interfacing with the brands that are producing these foods, uh, retailers who are selling these foods, and, uh, and consumers um, who are curious and want to know more about, uh, about GMOs and, um, and the non-GMO space. So uh, consumers trust us. Uh, and they trust us to be uh, paying attention to these issues and sharing information about um, about the GMO space, uh, and our standard and our program is set up in a way that consumer reports again and then for multiple years now, based on our process for developing our standard and how we execute on that and our third-party integrity, um, they continue to rank us as a highly meaningful label for consumers wishing to avoid GMOs in the food that they buy. Um, so the consumers trust us, and it, that's supported by these consumer groups that, that are you know, evaluating us, and they evaluate other non-GMO standards as well um, for consumers to know which labels they can trust and, and how they can connect. So let's jump into definitions. As I mentioned, this is a critical part of, uh, of the conversation. And, you know, one of, the, um, one of the things that we're hearing a lot about is that um, new techniques like gene editing um, are you know, are, are significantly different and are not GMOs. And so I want to talk a little bit about why we don't share that perspective. And so what I wanted to start by sharing with you is uh, the Codex Elementarius definition of biotechnology. Um, and this is really the most authoritative international definition of genetic engineering, um, which comes from the Codex, and which is the Codex, if you don't know, is a collection of Food, global food standards that are developed by the United Nations to address safety, quality, and international trade. And it's used by the World Health Organization, the World, World Trade Organization, and others. Um, this is also the definition that we use when we define what a GMO is. Um, and this is really kind of the crux of it. And the underlying section here talking about um, in vitro nucleic acid techniques, including recombinant deoxyribonucleic acid, um, this is the really important part because this definition um, is there's nothing in this definition that limits the definition to transgenics. Uh, and I'm sure you've talked about transgenics today, but for those of you that weren't paying attention, uh, you know, transgenics is taking genes from one species and moving it into another species. You know, part of the, the, the uh, leap forward in, in the new genetic engineering techniques is the ability to um, to actually get into the DNA of a species and manipulate it, um, even at the, you know, the base pair level, uh, which is, you know, in some cases really remarkable. Um, in other cases, though, the, the process by which you do that is, uh, falls under this definition. Um, and so because of that, uh, because of a little bit of that confusion, one of the things that, one of the narratives that's forming is that Anything that's not transgenic is not a GMO. And based on this definition and definition that, that's held up um, through the UN, um, that, doesn't, that isn't technically accurate. 
Likely you've talked a lot about CRISPR today. Everyone's really excited about CRISPR. Just wanted to make sure that we're um, also talking about all of the, uh, the other range of genetic engineering um, uh, and gene editing techniques. Um, here's a list of some of them. Uh, we have a research team that is uh, continues to stay on top of the new developments and products that are being and, and supply chain impacts that are happening with the proliferation of these new uh, this new technologies. Um, and we really recognize the rapid advancement of these genetic engineering um, techniques and the ability to create these new GMOs. And we want to want to make sure to highlight that. There, there's a real distinction between the medical and research applications of these new techniques, which is which is one thing. And on the other hand, there, the, the, the possibility of an unchecked proliferation of these new techniques in the food system without consent or transparency to consumers. So, so folks have lots of opinions about GMOs. You know, the question is whether or not consumers should have a right to know. Um, the process by which the food is being developed. And so um, I think this, making sure that we're talking about this, this whole um, suite of new techniques uh, is, is quite important. And we're not, so in, in summary on this, we consider based on this definition, all of these new techniques to be, uh, to be GMOs. We've um, felt that, uh, and known that for a long time because the definition is the codex definition, which hasn't changed. Um, I'm not actually sure when it was initially implemented, but uh, it has been quite a long time and well before these new techniques had, had um, really been popularized. So, and we've we've actually included for almost two years now uh, these techniques in our standard. And you know, one of the key challenges that these new techniques pose is that. Um, today, there aren't commercially available tests. So it's a big change from uh, the, the old GMOs, which you know, are transgenic, and um, it's a, easier to, to actually detect and test for those. And, and so there's a whole ecosystem that is out there testing uh, for those old GMOs, but the new GMOs are not yet testable. So we have for, as I mentioned, for uh, almost two years now, required uh, affidavits in our program uh, to, uh, to ensure that producers are being held accountable to making sure their supply chain for their verified products don't include products of these new techniques. So we require that affidavit. Now, I think it's also important to note that, that we work closely with the testing community as well, and there is a lot of activity happening right now to for the testing community to catch up with these new techniques and come up with new innovations in testing technology to be able to um, detect the presence of uh, of products of these new uh, new GMO techniques. And that's going to be very important, uh, especially when you start looking at the, the new bio dis uh, bioengineered disclosure uh, law, which I'll talk about in a second. And I'll just note that we're really the, we're the only certification that are taking a proactive approach to these new these new techniques in our standards. Um, other non-GMO uh, labels and certifications are quite silent on this uh, at this point. So we're not alone in this perspective on these new techniques. Um, in July, the EU, uh, the European Court of Justice, ruled that products of new genetic engineering techniques such as CRISPR, RNAi, and, uh, and gene drives are to be considered GMOs under European law. Um, what's also interesting is that um, in the new disclosure law in the, U in the US, You know, on the one hand, they call out that the new techniques shouldn't be, uh, or the new techniques, the process by which the food product is developed doesn't matter. What matters is what's in the end product. But on the other hand, on their high-risk food list, they include the, the Arctic apple and the Simplot potato. And the challenge there is that both of those products are actually products of RNAi. And so it, it really is kind of unclear in terms of what their position is on that. And there's more work to be do, to do with the USDA to help educate and get them um, clear on the position that they want to take. 
So what are some of the, how different are the new GMOs? And when you just look at it through the lens of what are some of the core concerns that we've been hearing for years and years about these products? Um, so these are the main ones, novel proteins. We, we lost your slides, impacts. so they're going to try and get them back up. Are we all right here? You lost my slides. We lost your slides, but we still see you okay, and, and hear you. You can't hear me? No, we can hear you, but we don't have your slides up. They're working on it right now. Okay. But if you want, go right ahead. I can still going. I can. I'll. I could sure. interpretive dance this table for you. Yep. No problem. So, uh, the point of this slide, is, I'm not sure if you even got a chance to see it. Um, I'm not sure. And let me know if there's something I can do on my end here. Andy, let me know. No, we don't have your slides, but we have a much better picture of you. Oh, oh lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just go ahead and keep going. Uh, we're good. We, we don't have your slides, but we'll just listen to you. You don't have my slides. Okay, so um, the, the slide that I'm trying to show, I should just turn my camera towards my, uh, my screen, um, is that there are there are a lot of similar concerns and, and similar uncertainty about the products of these new GMO techniques um, as there were with the old GMO, GMOs, which include things like off-target effects, as I mentioned. There's unknown health impacts from a long-term consumption standpoint, and um, this is recognized quite broadly, which is that this is a long-term effects of consuming GMOs is really challenging to, uh, to actually study. Uh, and so we, there still aren't, um, to our knowledge, and as of very recently, any long-term studies that have really shown the, the um, health implications of GMOs. There are ecological impacts, and which I hope you've spent some time talking about. And there's also this continued risk of contamination of conventional crops, which could be which could be impacting uh, and creating risk to export markets, especially when. Uh, overseas in Europe, which is, was taking a, a, another firm stance on this. So as far as consumer perspectives on GMOs, um, I'm, I'm really wondering, can I take a second to just try and share my screen again? And yeah, I'm going to be sharing some data now and, right. and uh, let me let me try doing this. Maybe. Are we back? Not. Yeah, there you go. You're up. All right. There's that great table I was just uh, dancing for you. Um, okay, so let's jump into what do consumers think about this? So, um, and the research I'm going to show you is from the Hartman Group, uh, which has been studying uh, consumer behavior for, for quite a long time. They produce a report called the Natural, uh, Organic and Natural Report. Uh, this is the most recent one from 2018, and I'll just highlight a couple of uh, key, I think, perspectives that are that are helpful to know. And I think it's really important when we start to think about where are consumers. There's a lot of work for all of us, I would say, to educate uh, consumers around uh, around this new technology uh, or these new these new techniques. Um, so that we can be supporting a level of transparency where they're making informed decisions which is, I think, the goal for, for all of us. So what they saw was in the, they talked to over 2,200 people across uh, the U.S., uh, across demographics, and these were some of their key findings. 97% said that they're aware of GMOs. So while that awareness is universal, the understanding of what GMOs is is, um, is actually quite low. And so that's, as I mentioned, that where education is really critical. When we actually start to look at, oh, sorry, one thing I will mention on this is 46% no, of those who responded try to avoid GMOs. So 46% of the population actively looking to avoid GMOs. When we, they started to dig into why do they do this? And an important part about Hartman's approach is they don't just send out surveys to people. They actually follow them through, they send out surveys, then they follow them through grocery stores, look at what they're looking at, 
ask them questions about why they're picking things up or choosing to buy one thing versus another, and then they go home with them and they look through their cupboards to really align kind of what their aspirational position is versus what their actual true buying habits are. So they do have that extra level of analysis, which is, I think, quality of analysis, which supports the quantitative. So what are the main reasons to avoid GMOs? So not surprisingly, there is concerns about the possible impact on health and well-being, and that's a general concern we're seeing across the food industry, why we're seeing significant growth in natural and organic food in general. There's a real need, especially with millennials, to provide a level of transparency in terms of what's in their food. So that links these first two. There's some concerns about health. They want to know exactly what goes into their food. They're concerned about the environment and the potential implications of GMOs on the environment. As I mentioned earlier, some don't want to be supporting companies that use GMOs, don't know enough about them, et cetera. I think the important thing is that although the primary driver is around health, shoppers are avoiding GMOs for a variety of reasons. Is that 70 percent of the 46 percent that avoid food? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so it's about 30 percent of the total. Yeah. Okay. So the key takeaways from this research, and we can share, there's lots more in this report if you're interested, and there are many other reports, but I think this is really poignant in terms of how they dug into this. These are the kind of key consumer perceptions around GMOs. So one, there's generally a discomfort around the idea of natural produce being changed by people into something unnatural. So there's just that discomfort. There's distrust in big business and its motivation for profit in developing these GMOs, and in science and the ability to have all the answers. So I think that's an important thing for us to be paying attention to. And there's also this uncertainty about the consequences of genetic engineering on their bodies and the world. Now, what was really critical, though, I think the conversation you're having today is they also shared a little bit about some of the new genetic gene editing techniques and shared about the difference between traditional kind of transgenics and these new techniques. And when they tested that, they found that it didn't actually change the perspective on these. So we don't have a lot of data on consumer perceptions around these new techniques because they are quite new. There's much more education to be done to really help understand consumers' perception of it. But this is an initial, and I think a strong data point, to suggest that there is just this, there's some general discomfort and distrust of this, of products produced with these technologies. So shifting into the kind of regulatory space, this distrust is showing up, as polls have shown for quite a few years now, that the vast, vast majority of Americans across demographic, across political lines, support mandatory GMO labeling. It was part of the drive for all the state legislations and a big part of the pressure that was put on for there then to be some federal law that would then come and preempt all the state laws. And so that just happened after a long and somewhat painful process. In December, the National Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard was published. The mandatory compliance date is in January 2022, so there's lots of time to comply. And this law requires mandatory disclosure of genetically engineered ingredients in certain foods. There are a couple of things in that statement, which is how do you define genetically engineered ingredients and certain foods. So there are clear exclusions in the program. There's exclusions for highly processed or refined foods and animal products. There's a lot to unpack here. The document itself is 263 pages. We've actually done a webinar recently breaking down the law and the implications. If that's something that you're interested in, we could certainly pass that along. But as far as how it relates to the new 
GMO techniques, um, it's really unclear, as I mentioned, whether the GMO ingredients that are derived through, um, for example, CRISPR and RNA require disclosure. It's really unclear. Um, the law says that there has to be detectable genetic material in the finished product, and that, that can't be uh, something that could be derived in nature. So it, it, all of a sudden it opens it way up because you could, you know, go in and argue that, oh, well, we're going in and doing gene editing, we're just changing a couple base pairs, and that's something that could happen in nature. Uh, so that's, that's challenging. But we don't even have tests yet to be able to test for these new, uh, new GMO techniques, so we don't really know um, how they would uh, be able to test for that. So that's kind of unclear. Um, and as I mentioned, both the apple and the potato on their high-risk list are, are created through RNAi. So there certainly are some products that are considered um, a bio bioengineered food, um, which is a new term that um, that they've they've developed, uh, BE, um, and uh, and which creates a bunch of challenges around the new label that's come out um, and the the kind of kind of pro biotech kind of stance that 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 has taken. So we're really unclear in terms of what the implications of that are going to be. From our standpoint, um, this is the statement that, that we came out. We also want to really kind of acknowledge that having worked in this space for over 12 years, uh, this is a really complex uh, issue uh, to deal with. And so while we applaud the effort to, to move towards mandatory labeling, um, this law as it, as it stands falls way, way short of actually being meaningful. Um, and, and really addressing what that 90% of Americans is really looking for, which is true GMO transparency. So in summary, um, maybe three things to leave you with. One, products of these new genetic engineering techniques are GMOs based on our definition, uh, which relies on the Codex uh, uh, Elementarius. The drivers for consumers to avoid GMOs don't change with these new techniques. So they don't change from perceptions around the old techniques. As of yet, more for us to learn there. And new regulations don't provide meaningful GMO transparency to customers. And so that's what we're really looking for here is, you know, with all of the excitement around this new technology, all the potential medical and research applications, um, when we start talking about people's food and people's right to know what's in their food, uh, we believe that it is critically important and, and we will continue to do our work to help provide a level of transparency um, that uh, that regulators uh, aren't providing today. Um, and we would encourage regulators uh, in a position to be able to provide more meaningful labeling um, to do so. So with that, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to present to you and happy to take uh, take some questions. Well, yep. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Um, we do have questions here. We'll hopefully uh, it'll be smooth. So. Joy, why don't you go ahead? My name is Joy Sterling, and I ser I'm on serving my second term on this board. And my question is, why were the highly processed and refined foods excluded if there wasn't some question about they were somehow connected with GMO? Why would that even come up? I cannot. That is a great question. Uh, it's one of the. It's, one of the main complaints about the new law, because a huge amount of the GMOs that are out there um, are used in highly processed food. So if you had, are growing GMO corn and you, um, you're going to turn that into a, a, a corn syrup and you highly process it, um, or a canola and a canola oil, um, there's no longer any gen detectable genetic material um, in that final product, and therefore doesn't require disclosure. So I, I can't speak to, to why, other than um, uh, yeah, that's a bad I can't thing. speak to why. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of pushback on that. And just a, uh, a follow-up on that is that is that you mentioned distrust of science. That that's terribly problematic. Distrust of science? Yeah. 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 So you're talking about in terms of drivers. Um, so the distrust, oh, I just jumped back to that. 
Marine, if it's helpful. So the distrust is in science and its ability to have all the answers. So, so to put a finer point on this, you know, what they found, it's not an overall distrust in science, it's in uh, distrust that, that, that science has all of the answers to this. Uh, to the, this complexity. Um, so it's a little bit more than that. It's not necessarily a general distrust in science, it's a distrust in the ability for science to have all the answers. Bryce, go ahead. Thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, Bryce Lundberg, uh, Lundberg Family Farms. I, I, you know, Hi, Bryce. My family produces organic rice. I was wondering if, um, if organic certification organizations um, are in agreement with you on the um, a definition and the um, uh, on whether or not these new techniques are, are GMOs and applicable for organic. Great. So I think I I, I think I caught that. So I just want to make sure I got it. So um, where where does organic stand relative to our position on? Definition in these new techniques. Yeah, and I was right? organic. Yeah, so folks like OTA um, and CCOF, um, I suppose NOSB would be another one. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I haven't. So okay, here's what I do know. When we were providing uh, comments on um, on the law. Um, in both cases, uh, we, we were in contact with the OTA uh, and really looking to align our statements around this. Um, and they look to they look to the similar definition that we do. Um, but I haven't heard them publicly come out and talk specifically about these new techniques. I mean, as we were saying, you know, as I said earlier at work, Really, because this is the, our single issue that we're really focused on, we think it's really important to be out there uh, educating and talking about this um, right away. Um, I don't know, but I could I could look into it. I haven't been in touch with them um, directly on this uh, in terms of whether they have uh, come out with a, a public uh, opinion on where their stance is with respect to these new um, these new GMO techniques. Will you be doing a B free uh, certification? Okay, that, that's kind of a joke. Okay. A, a B, did you say BE free? Yeah, we're gonna do B free. Huh. Okay. B free, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank no, you, Jeff. no, we think that that. I mean, that's one of the one of the core issues that was raised right away uh, with this new law. I'm not sure if any of you saw the initial logo um, was a smiling, happy face with BE as the eyes, um, and there was like huge pushback against. It was coming across as a fairly biased logo, um, but in general, you know, so many of the comments were really pushing for using GMO as the term. And actually, this is something that even when you talk to strong proponents of, of GMOs, they, they say as well, you know, that it's not helping anybody to be introducing a new new terminology at this point. It's just creating additional confusion for consumers and more education um, to try and catch them up on what what is BE and what does it mean. So we're sticking with GMOs. Hi, Jeff. Nancy Cassidy, uh, retailer. Um, so we heard today from a plant breeder that when a seed is subjected to the CRISPR technology, it is identical, absolutely cannot uh, be determined any difference between that and a seed that has not been uh, altered. Would you comment on that? I am not a scientist, so I, I, I can't comment on that, um, and it's, a, I think, a more nuanced conversation. So if they altered the seed, did they alter the seed? I mean, did they make a change to the seed or not? They did. They did make a change to the seed. So um, in the testing experts that we talk to, they say that it is possible, it is possible to be able to test for um, some of these new techniques. It's just not commercially um, cost effective at this point. Um, and there's a lot more work to be done. So are they the same? I mean, that's one question. 
Um, one of the questions that we, maybe this helps, one of the questions that we get a lot is, you know, around animal-derived products. So we consider in our standard that if an animal is eating GMO feed and downstream that's ending up as yogurt, um, that that's not allowed in our program. And the reason for that is because the vast majority of GMOs are grown for uh, animal feed um, and uh, ethanol as well. And so we're trying to change the, the supply chain. And my point there is that it's not just the end product that matters, it's the process by which it's, um, it's developed that's important to people uh, to, and to consumers as well. Um, so I can't, I can't, uh, I don't want to step out of my, um, really my area of focus here. But that, that's the perspective that we take on this. If you're exposing uh, these products to uh, this kind of technology, we're calling it a GMO, and we want to do that so that consumers can have transparency around that and then make their own decisions about whether or not they buy that. Thank you. So, Jeff, I'm, this is Don Cameron. Um, I farm in California here. Uh, but I, I had a question. Are you finding that there are is that some of your clients may may be dealing with a product that really doesn't have a GMO um, in in being grown anywhere? I mean, there's no GMO for that crop, but but they want they want the non-GMO label on their product mm. for I, I don't know. I guess in a, uh, just to be clear, but but doesn't that kind of throw the the ones that aren't labeling in, into a conundrum as far as they're, they're yeah. kind of put in a pile that, well, they, they, there's no GMO avail, available for that product, but they're, they're, if they don't have your label, then are they considered, you know, do they have the stigma that they might have a, a GMO in their product? Yeah, I see. Long, long question. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a good question. It's something that we, um, we can point in the direction of a blog that gets into lots of detail on this. Um, maybe two things quick to say about that. Uh, oftentimes what, what, one example that comes up is orange juice, right? There are no GMO oranges. Well, if you look at your ingredient panel on your orange juice, there's more in there than just oranges. So in a lot of cases, um, it's an oversimplified view of what's in the supply chain to produce that product. So that's one angle, um, which, is, which is important. So for example, citric acid, if it's added to the orange juice, um, citric acid can be can be, um, and a lot of it is made uh, with GMOs. So, so there's that first level of digging into the supply chain and what are the actual ingredients. Uh, the, other, the other part of this is when you think about labels like gluten-free, um, what we're trying to do is support consumers that are making you know, very quick decisions in uh, when they're doing their shopping to know that they're, they, they can trust the products that they're buying. And we're hearing this more and more from brands um, that the, the, the butterfly label or things like gluten-free add another level of trust that the brand that's put this together is actually working with third parties to help um, support uh, the, the transparency and the supply chain that they're using. Um, and so it helps consumers that are buying non-GMO to to when they're looking at new products, you know, on, on, on a new shelf, that that's one thing for them to be able to cue into to know, like, okay, this is non-GMO. That's good to know because, as we're expecting to see with this new these new techniques, we're going to see GMOs popping up much more rapidly than back in the day when we were just dealing with large commodities and big biotech companies. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that that does answer the question. But, uh, thank you. Yeah. We had another question. Oh. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Don. Um, my concern in this whole discussion today has been, you know, it's really about the consumer's choice and what kind of choices they want to make. And and I was I was a little uh, well, I wasn't surprised, but on your next to the last slide. Uh, you have some language that says you're going to protect the consumer, and which implies that non-GMO food, in, in my mind, is not safe. And, and really, 
I, to me, your logo is to inform the consumer that it is a non-GMO product. And um, to, to say you're looking out for my safety, uh, you know, I guess I'd like to see what the science is um, because, um, you know, I, I think informed choices are important and if people are not in favor of GMO food, then, then I can look at the label and make that decision. But, but, but for you to say that you're going to protect me, um, I, I have a problem with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, is there a, do you have a, do you want me to just respond to that? Sure. Or, okay. Is there a question? Okay. So the question around, does it do enough to protect consumers? Well, so, um, I guess in, in, in this case, it, like we're getting down to semantics in terms of what we mean about protect in this way, what we're talking about protecting consumers from is the proliferation of GMOs in our food supply. And the, the intent behind mandatory labeling is to provide a level of uh, transparency for all consumers, not just those, uh, those brands that are voluntarily paying more to get verified through third party certifications, um, but instead to try and provide uh, a, a level of transparency across the, uh, across the, the food system. And, and what we're saying here is, is that if the intent was to provide that information, um, this law doesn't doesn't provide that level of transparency, and therefore is not protecting consumers from um, from the prolifer potential proliferation of GMOs in their food. So, um, hopefully that 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 clarifies. We don't. Um, we just we are just reflecting back the health concerns that are that we're hearing about when we talk to consumers. Um, uh, about this, and there is, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the main health concerns that, that haven't really, well, there are lots of concerns that, that haven't been really answered around uh, around GMO. So, uh, you know, I appreciate I appreciate your perspective that um, that you you see this as us protecting uh, consumers from something that is that um, may or may not be harmful. Uh, and, you know, we're really just seeing it from a transparency standpoint. So consumers can make that decision. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate your presentation and, and the time spent uh, on our questions here. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and hope to see you again. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk about uh, animal agriculture and genomics. Uh, we have uh, Dr. James Murray, UC Davis Department of Animal Science. Dr. Murray is the chair of the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. Dr. Murray's work is focused on two key areas, uh, genetic engineering of mammals and horse genomics. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm probably not really going to talk much about genomics um, because I thought my understanding from having corresponded with Josh after Allison passed the baton to me was to really talk about gene editing, which is something that I've been involved with. And I've been involved with genetic engineering in animals since the inception of the technology in the early 1980s. So I have tremendous experience <clears throat> and mostly have focused on working for uh, genetic engineering and now gene editing in livestock animals for use in agriculture. I've not really worked on the biomedical side much. So I'll try to go through this fairly rapidly. I've cut, this is kind of a joint slide deck between Allison and I and, and hopefully leave time, more time for discussion. And I will get heavily into the regulation at the end. So when you're looking at biotechnology and how it's used, if you really go to the scientific definition, I suppose, you really would have to consider everything from using yeast to make beer and wine, artificial insemination, embryo transfer, ovum pickup, all of these things constitute the, the whole realm of biotechnologies. And within that, then, there's your subset, at least on the animal side, uh, with cloning and then genomic selection, genetic engineering, and genome editing. And I'm not going to go through everything on the bottom of the slide. Uh, but the, you, you have the slide deck here, but there's a lot of 
applications in all of these areas. And to this day, the most genetically engineered animal and gene edited animal would be probably the mouse and then the zebrafish, which has been entirely done for research purposes. Uh, but there are biomedical, there's pharmaceutical products, uh, pest control, and then agriculture food products uh, across a wide range. And I'll get into some of those more specifically in a little bit. Um, one of the things I will mention on the genomic side, the more information we have gained, the more ability we have to carry out selection. I'm sorry I couldn't be here this morning to see if Richard talked about it on the plant side. Um, but this graph is one that Allison put together. She's directly involved in working on uh, genomic selection. And you can see that the average gain has increased significantly when you can imply a panel of selectable markers genomic markers that are linked to techniques, uh, to, te to traits that you're selecting for, as well as physical measures in the case of the Holstein's milk quantity, quality, protein, whatever it might be. So the technology has led to a significant increase in our ability to select our animals, which gets into all of our animals and all of our plants are genetically modified. As a geneticist, by training, I dislike the term and choose not to use it because I think it's not meaningful. Um, genetic engineering, I'll touch really briefly on it because gene editing and genetic engineering are two different things, and I'll get into that in a minute. Genetic engineering is the manipulation of the organism's genomes by introducing, eliminating, so a knockout, and rearranging specific genes using modern biotechnology, usually recombinant DNA, as was previously defined. And when you're looking at transgenics and GE, you're really looking at moving whole genes or regulatory parts of genes. Um, they don't have to come from a different species. The first transgenic sheep I ever made had all sheep sequences in it. We'd taken control region from one gene and the protein producing region of another gene and put them together to change the expression pattern of a gene, but it was all sheep. But that would still be considered a transgenic. And there are uses on the production side. Most cheese is made using recombinant renin these days. Not all. A lot of plants are genetically engineered via big agronomic crops. And there have been animals genetic engineered, in fact, before the first plants. <clears throat> but they've never met with uh, regulatory approval other than the Aqua Advantage salmon, which is on the market in Canada and approved in the U.S., but it's been banned from being imported or produced in the country, so it's kind of a catch-22 for the salmon. Currently available transgenic livestock, and, and we wrote, recently wrote a review that came out last year, and these are five transgenics. You can see when they were made. The first one is the salmon. It was re first reported in 1992. It was produced in 1989. Um, it's the only approved transgenic animal for food for agriculture use in the world. The other four have all had substantial research done on them. So in addition to the original paper that presented the, the creation of the animal, these have all had five papers up to our own work, which is the lysozyme transgenic goats that we produce at Davis, where we've published 18 papers on the safety, efficacy, uh, functionality of what we've done. So these are all currently available transgenic livestock, but other than the salmon, none of them have regulatory approval and therefore aren't being used. Um, so getting into gene editing, I don't know how much explanation you got this morning. I do want to give a little bit before I get into some of the ways it's being used in animals. And essentially, gene editing relies on creating a double-stranded break at a targeted location in the genome. And in the past, in order to do a transgenic insert, you had to have a break, but it was random. With the advent of the gene editing techniques in 1995 with zinc fingers, we were able to then to target that. And so, as you can see here on the slide, if you, the cell has many pathways to repair DNA. If you get a double-stranded break in your DNA, the cell has two choices. It fixes the break or it dies. That's the only two choices the cell has. So you have a lot of redundant mechanisms in which to repair that cell. And the most commonly one used one in our somatic cell tissue, non-germline, is NEGJ, which just basically takes 
any two ends of free DNA and sticks it together. And this is how your body seals that break. And that's a natural way of creating uh, mutations. You can get deletions and you can get insertions by doing that. On the other hand, if you provide some sort of donor template, which is shown in blue here, then you can actually have homology-dependent repair. And that can either take the form of simply copying your repair template, which would be a small break, or you can go to the extent of inserting an entire transgene. And so depending upon how you're using the technology, you can end up with a transgenic animal. But I would argue on the non-homologist end joining side, they're not transgenic. So I disagree with the previous speaker. And when you look at that, we've had three different systems developed since 1995. The first one is zinc finger, and that is where we worked out the mechanism by which proteins could recognize and specifically bind DNA. And then we could make that protein in the laboratory, we could hook it up to a enzyme domain that would cut DNA, and we could make our own enzyme to cut DNA. So when you use zinc finger as a gene editing tool, you're not injecting any nucleic acid, you're injecting a protein. So it would not fit with the codex definition. Um, that started in 1995. About 10 years later, we got talons. This is another bacterial system in this case, again using a protein alphabet, as it were, to recognize and read DNA. And so by building a specific tail on each strand of DNA, as I've shown here under talon, you can then, in fact, again, specifically target DNA. And again, you have to provide an enzymatic domain, which is the, the FOC1 nuclease domain. Again, when you use talons to create gene editing, you're only injecting protein. If you're going down the non-homologous end joint, joining route to say just cause a mutation rather than an insertion of some kind. So both of those just inject a protein. When you go to CRISPR-Cas system, which we're using and is being probably more heavily used now than the talons, there you're using an RNA guide, which is a nucleic acid, but not DNA. Uh, a small amount of RNA, and then you're using a protein again. You can either inject a gene which would produce all of this as RNA and protein, or you can inject the RNA guide and you can with the protein. They'll complex, and then again, they will specifically target DNA and specifically then cut. Once you've got that double stand break, as I said, it has to be repaired. You can either go the non-homologist end joining or other random repair uh, pathways that are in the cell, or you can go homology-dependent repair, in which case you can either get um, a conversion when you use a short sequence, or you can actually insert a transgene. So it can go either way. And those are the three current systems. Since CRISPR was first reported about six years ago, they've now found... I think at last count that I saw five or six CRISPR-like systems from other bacteria. So it may be like restriction enzyme systems where there's going to be multiple different versions of that from multiple different bacterial uh, genre, and that's going to then give you different capabilities. So how might they be used in food animals, which is probably you're most interested in? And these are work that are going on around the world today that Allison and I know of. I, I'm guessing there's things that we don't know of uh, at present. But in cattle, I'll tell you a little bit more about polled because we've had the polled animals at Davis and some of you might have heard of those. And that's essentially trying to introduce the polled allele which exists in beef cattle, such as Hereford or Angus, into breeds that are horned, Wagyu or Holsteins. Because right now, something like dairy animals, 90% of our Holsteins have horns. They're removed by the veterinarian when they're calves. And that's an animal welfare issue. There's pain, there's cost, there's suffering. Uh, but yet having no horns is a good trait, particularly for animals going in and out of a dairy parlor. It keeps them from hurting each other. It keeps them from hurting the workers. So dehorning is necessary. Um, but it can't be done genetically because if you were to cross your high producing Holstein with your Angus, you would have a black and white cow that didn't produce milk 
or didn't produce good milk. And it would take about eight to 10 back crosses to a high genetic merit line to bring back up the milk producing capacity. So you'd be looking at somewhere around 20 years, maybe 30 years in order to introduce it. So in fact, that's why there isn't polled in dairy today. There's a few lines of polled Holsteins, but they're poor milk producers, and therefore the elite breeders don't use them. And if you do that crossing, you're going to destroy your genetic merit. So that's, that's something that's available. Um, animals are available. In fact, semen from the animals which were at Davis have been uh, transported to Australia. They now have those animals there. They're working with the Australians to introduce it. They're also the company that owns the cattle are working with uh, Canada as well. Myostatin is a gene that causes uh, muscle growth. So if you knock out myostatin, you'll get a double muscling phenotype. Um, that's been done, last time I checked, in at least seven countries and in every major uh, livestock meat-producing breed that I know of, in, including people trying it in fish. Beta-lactoglobulin has been silenced using RNAi and then by uh, CRISPR. Uh, to eliminate the primary milk aller allergen that affects young children. Beta-lact, there's multiple allergies that you can have from milk, but beta-lactoglobulin is the main allergen that young kids would be faced with. And that's different to the lactose intolerance and different to being casein, allergic to casein, but it's a major allergen and, and has no known function in the milk that we're aware of. Um, Interspecies insertion of that SB110 gene is to uh, confer resistance to tuberculosis, so that would be a transgenic approach using uh, CRISPR. Chicken ovalbumin gene has been silenced to remove it from egg. Again, it's an allergen. Insertion of uh, immunoglobulin heavy chain is, is a germline editing, and it was used to do that, but that's really more of a biomedical use than a farm use. Uh, myostatin gene silencing, again, has been done in the goats. Prion protein has been uh, silenced or deleted. Again, lack of mad cow disease if you remove the prion. Again, the prion doesn't have a known function. You can remove it, and the animal is fine. Again, beta-lac has been silenced also in goats. Uh, same reasons for cattle. In pigs, I'll show a slide in a minute about CD163 gene silencing. Again, it's been done both in uh, England and in Missouri. And that's to take out the uh, porcine respiratory virus, which is one of the leading viral diseases that affects the pig industry. Um, in the interspecies warthog uh, rela substitution, that's where they're taking an allele. This is an allele conversion approach taking the allele from the warthog, which is resistant to African swine fever, transferred into domestic pigs. If domestic pigs get African swine fever, your entire herd will be dead in about seven to 10 days. And it has gotten into Europe from Africa, and it's currently in Russia, and it's currently actually in Western China. And it's, it's causing a lot of devastation because it's essentially 100% lethal. Um, again, myostatin, every, like as I said, Every, every meat animal basically has had myostatin. Uh, knockout of the sexual maturity pathways being worked on at Davis, at least. I also know it's being worked on one other place. Again, this is a case where so you'd be able to eliminate castration as a welfare issue. Um, in sheep, the FGF5 gene silencing increases wool length and yield. So there's a, a lot of applications and there's more we could do other slides worth of applications. These are things that are ongoing at the, at the present. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about the gene editing and, and how it would work, um, this is the African swine fever. And again, essentially, as I mentioned, it's 100% lethal. It's moving uh, into China from the West at the moment. And the way this works is they have identified a single gene mutation, a SNP. In this case, it's as a single nucleotide change. In the warthog that allows the warthog, it will get the virus, it will get sick, it will then recover, and it will be resistant to the virus for the rest of its life, as opposed to the domestic pig, which gets the virus and dies. And so by collecting eggs from your domestic pig embryo, they're probably collecting uh, one-cell embryos, um, injecting those embryos with the CRISPR or talon-based uh, substrates. You can then get 
conversion of the domestic pig allele to the allele that's in the warthog. And that was done at the Roslyn Institute. And those pigs, they do have a line of pigs now that have the warthog gene. And they will have to be taken to Perbright, which is their biocontainment level 4 facility, in order to be tested to see if they're resistant to the uh, virus. The porcine respiratory uh, syndrome, which I was talking about, um, you can see that it's very widespread across the world. Um, essentially, only Australia is free of it. And uh, you can see the dollar cost of that disease. In the pig industry, it is really the largest uh, disease issue in the swine industry. And both of these labs, so Kristen Whitworth and uh, Randy Prather's lab at the University of Missouri and Christine Burkhardt at the Roslyn Institute, um, in both cases independently, independently identified the same cell surface receptor that the virus binds to. And between the two labs, they have knocked it out and they've also mutated it so that the virus, if it's absent, the virus can't bind and get into the cell. If they mutate it, then the virus can't bind and get into the cell. And basically, those pigs have been tested. The ones from the uh, University of Missouri were sent to Kansas State, where the level four containment lab is, and have been tested, and they're resistant. They're not susceptible to the virus. So this is a potential genetic approach to uh, blocking the disease. I've taken some other things out in interest of time that we could talk about. <clears throat> but the point really is that this, this is a genetic improvement which is permanent and is, is generational. And so it's a solution to that animal disease and it helps reduce antibiotic usage and chemical usage as well as then uh, the cost of caring for the animals which is a production cost. Uh, myostatin, I, I couldn't go by without showing a picture. Um, here you have on the cattle that you're looking at the back ends of are Nolore, so they are a Brazilian uh, cattle. This was done at Texas A&M. And then the pigs were done in China. And again, it just increases the muscle. There are uh, several different known natural myostatin mutations that give varying levels of increasing muscle. So you can tailor it to get what's a production level of muscle that you want without going to the level of something like a Belgian blue, which actually has dystocia issues because of the muscling. Um, the gene editing poll, this is Allison with the blue scarf on, one of her graduate students. These were the two calves that were produced by uh, Recombinetics and then sent to Davis. Um, they should have horns. Genetically, they had their, both their parents were horned. The reason they don't have horns is that the uh, Celtic allele from Angus was transferred into these animals using talons at the at cells in culture, and then they were clones. So these are actually clones as well. Um, and we raised them at Davis, studied them, bred them. We still have offspring from them at Davis. And semen was collected by the company, Recombinetics, and is being used certainly in Australia. I think it's also in Brazil at this point. So one of the things you have to look at of these techniques, they're cumulative. Breeding, genetic modification of plants and animals occurred as soon as we domesticated them. There are genetic changes between any domestic and its wild relative. And over the millennia of, of having plants and animals, we've developed breeding goals, we've developed mathematical ways to do selective breeding, which was the progeny testing. We've enhanced that by things like artificial insemination, um, embryo transfer, genomic selection. And now we have genome editing and genetic engineering, which are a way of adding diversity, adding specific traits in without impacting the broader genome of those animals, which have been selected for the use we have for them. So they're no longer what they were when they were uh, wild. Uh, regulation, I do want to touch on this. I think it's important, and I think it's important uh, in your considerations. Um, Argentina is essentially not looking at process-based. One of the issues that the European Union has is that it's process-based. 
I can make a transgenic animal in which there's no protein ever produced. All I've done is put in a piece of DNA. We eat DNA in everything we eat. All organic things have DNA or RNA. And so DNA itself is recognized as safe to eat. We digest DNA. We don't take on the traits of the things we eat by absorbing their genes. And so a process-based approach, and that's one of my concerns with, with the, uh, the GMO project, is it's concerned with the presence or absence of DNA, which is not what's functional. It's protein, which is functional for the most part. And just having DNA, and that's why my understanding, like in processed oil or processed sugar, sugar is sugar. It doesn't matter whether it comes from a transgenic sugar beet or cane sugar or non-transgenic sugar beet. It's crystalline sugar is a specific structure. And I think that was the rationale for excluding uh, highly processed. Um, so Argentina is basically saying that if there is a new genetic combination, <coughs> then it can be uh, regulated as a transgenic. If the method um, using the transgene is temporary or there's no permanent insertion of DNA, then it's not subject to regulation. So they're taking the attack that, for instance, um, the knockout, what am I going to, I'm thinking one of the old examples, the uh, knockout of the allele for PERS in pigs is not transgenic. It's taking out that gene. That would not be regulated under the uh, Argentine rules. Canada has a very similar regulatory uh, approach. But that's different from the EU, correct? The EU is the completely process-based. The EU has a blanket ban. Mm -hmm. And the EU, if you, if you read the court ruling, it actually even says mutagenesis techniques are GMO. If you use radiation, if you, which, and remember, there's several thousand plant varieties in agriculture that were produced through radiation. That, but if it was done before 2001, it's okay. <laughs> so they've, they've, again, they're having trouble. And remember, Sweden has said CRISPR is not necessarily GMO and won't necessarily be regulated as per the EU. So there is some difference there. So process-based, I think, makes it difficult versus product-based. Um, the FDA had a, a guidance for transgenic animals. They put out a draft of that guidance, uh, 187, in uh, 2017 for comment. And essentially what they're now saying, if you intentionally want to alter DNA, it's going to be regulated as a drug. If you get the same alteration in DNA unintentionally, i.e. .e. mutation, it's not going to be regulated. And that's where the FDA is, but to, they have not released this guidance, even though the comment period ended in June of 2017. So there is an issue there. And again, it's very process-based. It is not product-based. Um, again, I can genetically engineer an animal such as my goats, where the intent is to put human lysozyme in the milk but there's no protein product in the meat. The DNA is everywhere, but the protein isn't. And so if you were to eat the meat from those goats, you're not eating any product of the transgene, you're just eating DNA. And I think that's one of the issues with process versus product-based regulation. Um, the USDA statement recently, uh, Secretary Perdue has said that the USDA is not going to regulate plants produced by things like CRISPR as GMO, again, a term I don't like, as genetically engineered. So there, now the federal agencies are not on the same uh, page in terms of how they're going to regulate, which causes issues because as an animal person, the FDA thinks they have control over what I do, not the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, but according to that, intentionally mutated thing, this calf would be evaluated as an animal drug because it carries the Celtic allele that's in every polled Angus or Hereford that you've ever seen on the side of the highway that was naturally polled versus one that was dehorned. Um, whereas the beef cow is not. So it's exactly the same DNA sequence. 
that's in my cow because it was intentionally put there is regulated as a drug. And the offspring are regulated as a drug because the DNA going through meiosis is a drug residue. And in fact, if I do a knockout where I just delete, like in myostatin, there's just a deletion. The deletion going through meiosis, so the absence of DNA going through meiosis will be regulated as a drug residue intergenerationally. That's where we're at with regulation in the United States. Um, <clears throat> what's really important is what's at the bottom of this slide. Um, Allison and Elizabeth Maga at Davis in my department, they sequenced these calves uh, to 20 times, uh, so 20 times the genome, amount of DNA in the genome to look for off-target mutations. They did not find any. Or what I really should say is, is you find several million changes, even if you sequence the same animal, which they did three times, you will still find several million differences in the genome. And that's to do with the technology. It's also to do with mutation. So in fact, a CRISPR is particularly a CRISPR-induced insertion or deletion or a CRISPR-based uh, single nucleotide change will in fact scientifically not be possible to detect. There will be no way to do that. You can sequence and say there's a difference in the DNA. You will not be able to say that it was caused by a CRISPR or a talon or a zinc finger. And as far as off-target effects, the same problem is there are more. If we were to take any two people in the room and sequences, we'd probably have somewhere between 12 and 24 million base pairs difference between any two of us. When you're looking at that amount of natural variation that goes through meiosis, off-target effects become very difficult. It's not saying off-target effects aren't there, but they actually occur every meiosis, every generation. No two steaks you've ever eaten, no two pieces of broccoli are genetically identical. They don't have the same DNA. And that's just science. And of course, I would argue the spotty guy was not a drug. It was a cow. Um, the National Pork Producer Council has put out a position paper on this. And I've highlighted and read the two parts, which I'll read to you. The first part is, is that the FDA regulatory path will result in a lengthy and expensive approval project process and functionally make any gene edited animal a living animal drug and every farm raising them as a drug manufacturing facility. And that's the other issue. If they're a drug and you're going to contain drugs and you're going to contain the manure from your drugs, and the urine from your drugs, how that's, it's, it becomes this issue. Um, and then the, the last sentence says, the FDA approach is also out of step with the regulatory pathways under development in the rest of the world. Certainly true that they're out of sync with Canada, with Brazil, with Argentina, with Australia, that I know of, and out of sync with Europe, but that would be, well, I wouldn't say it's in a good way, Europe is dysfunctional and that they ban everything and we're dysfunctional that we don't approve anything on the animal side. Canada has novel based food regulation. They look at when you submit an application, is it new? If I was to take uh, Burry's calves to Canada, I could sell them into the meat chain because Canada is going to say, we've been eating the Celtic allele. It is not new, it is not novel, therefore it's not regulated. And in fact, as, as mentioned here, Recombinetics, which is the company that, that uh, made Bury and Spotty Guy, they've actually are going to Canada because they can see a pathway forward when in the US they can't see a pathway for their product. So they'll be actually taking their technology offshore, as is Aqua Bounty with the salmon. They're focused on growing their operation offshore. Um, so would gene editing polled Holsteins be subject to additional regulations? In Argentina, no. In Australia, yes, but that's because Australia has, has a 20 base pair limit on how much DNA you can add. If it's less than 20 base pairs, it's not going to be regulated. If it's more than 20 base pairs, it will. And that's proposed. That's a draft regulation. I don't know if it's been approved yet. Brazil has said no. Canada would be no. The European Union, of course, would be yes, because they've defined everything as GMO. Uh, Japan would be no, New Zealand would be yes, and of course the United States at present is a yes. 
And does it really make sense to regulate gene edited polled dairy calves differently to naturally occurring polled beef calves? As a scientist, I, I would argue it does not, particularly when the DNA in the case of putting in the, the allele from the uh, beef cattle, it's the same DNA. So, Jim, going back to um, the U.S. regulations, yes. so isn't the FDA, it's not a final rule, right? There hasn't been a final rule issued, so there, it's not regulated currently? Well, that is my understanding. Okay. That, well, I should say that's the principle under which I'm currently operating. <laughs> um, the guidance 187 is in place for transgenics, but they have not issued a final rule for um, gene editing. That was written in the previous administration, and, and I think the current administration is, is less likely to move forward. But on the other hand, having, being somebody who deals with the FDA on this all the time, um, we certainly have not gotten movement from them. Um, so there are issues there at the present. Um, this is something that Allison and I recently written, and we've, we've essentially have come out and, and stated along with Kevin Wells from Missouri, that the FDA approach is not fit for purpose. It does not um, regulate food animals in a, in a way that is logical or makes sense, or in fact addresses the issues they purport are there. And as I mentioned before, dietary DNA is generally regarded as safe. It's called grass. It's actually an application you can apply for to the FDA, which they, um, as a matter of policy, simply not regulation, but as policy, have simply said no transgenic will be given grass status, even if it's uh, pulled dairy cows or lysozyme in the milk, which uh, are consumed regularly anyway. So, uh, but DNA is safe to eat. Again, and it's only DNA in the food product, then there isn't necessarily an issue or shouldn't be an issue. And one of the other things that we've been talking about for a long time but doesn't get any traction is if we don't use these technologies to increase economic and environmental sustainability of food production, I'm sure you're all aware of the predictions of what the population is going to do. If we truly hit 10 million people in 2050, we will have to produce as much food per year as we've produced since mankind evolved, came out of Africa per year. From now until back through the millennia, we'll have to produce that much per year with less land, less water, if we have three billion more people. So we need to increase the environmental and economic sustainability of agriculture so that it's productive now and if it's productive in the future. And if we don't use all the technology at our disposal, then what are we willing to give up? So one of the things that's been absent in the GMO debate, and again, I don't like the word, but I didn't frame it, um, is what are the benefits? What are the risks and what are the benefits of using the technology in any given circumstance? And, and not necessarily, and I would argue, uh, we probably don't want cold tolerant genetically engineered catfish in the Sacramento River because it's going to destroy the ecosystem. On the other hand, there are other applications where we can have a very positive benefit. And so what are we willing to give up? And here's an example of what we would give up if we had not done artificial insemination. And um, that was long enough ago. I don't think any of us remember the debate. But post-World War II, when AI was introduced into the dairy industry, you had a lot of the same debate, a lot of the same opposition to using artificial insemination that we have today about using recombinant DNA techniques. And where would we be if we hadn't had AI? And this is production, and if you'll look at the number of cows in the United States in 1940, which was almost 25 million, and it's now down to, what, way less than the 25 million, and the amount of milk produced. There's been something like a 350% increase in milk with a third the number of cows. 
that increases the environmental sustainability of dairy. It increases the economic sustainability. We would have given that up if we had chosen not to use AI. Also, we wouldn't have broad-breasted turkeys for Thanksgiving because that industry is entirely based upon artificial insemination. Um, so in summary, there are a range of modern biotechnologies that are used in food animal breeding. Uh, that do include genomics, genomic-based selection technology, genetic engineering, which is the transgenics, and gene editing. But I would caution that gene editing and genetic engineering are not identical things. Um, breeders have already used these tools to work on sustainability traits, um, including disease resistance, animal welfare, drought salt tolerance in plants, product quality. There's a lot of work going on in animals. When the genetic engineering side, there got to be very little work going on in the Western world because the regulatory dysfunction wouldn't allow any products to market. But now with gene editing, there actually are a lot of labs doing work and companies at this point. Um, on the grounds that they are predicting the regulatory environment will be better. Ultimately, the biotechnologies complement genetic improvement methods. It is just a technique, and it should be used when appropriate and not used when not appropriate. It's like any other technique. It isn't a, a, a silver bullet. It doesn't solve all problems. It also isn't the end of the world and causes all problems. It's just a technique. Um, and lastly is that forgoing safe breeding methods comes with a high potential cost in terms of what do we give up? What, do we, what benefits do we choose not to use, not to have, if we don't want to use the technology? And I'll stop there for questions. Dr. Murray, thank you very much for your presentation. Pretty enlightening. Um, do we have any additional questions from... Uh, from the board? Yep, go ahead, Nancy. I have a simple question. Yep. What does polled mean? Polled means no horns. Thank you. So we went from, if you look at an aurochs, which was the foundation animal for cattle, had these massive horns because they had to deal with wolves and things, down to a longhorn type horn, down to most Angus that you see are naturally polled. They've never had horns, they don't grow horns. Because we protect them, they don't have to protect themselves. Yeah, go ahead, Bryce. Uh, hey, Dr. Murray, uh, thank you very much. Very interesting, quite outside my area of expertise, and, and I'll look, um, look forward to in investigating these uh, issues further. Um, and, and by the way, um, my grandfather on my mother's side was James Murray, uh, and uh, from Straven. In uh, just south of Glasgow, is that um, is that the same area? I'm a Highland Scot. Okay, very good. Um, <laughs> um, Murray's Murray, as you know, is like Smith or Jones. It's there you go everywhere. <laughs> um, what was your position on uh, a BGH uh, and and whether all technology related to um, to animal um, husbandry is is acceptable or not acceptable. I mean, certainly on that milk, uh, milk had ended in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't go into uh, to 2019. Um, you know, that, that would increase um, milk production, and, and yet um, it would. much of the um, consumer uh, uh, acceptance of that, I think, has, um, or there's been, reducing, uh, or, or I should say, I don't know that, the brands I see have um, information on them that indicating that it wasn't produced with uh, BGH. The, and, um, it, it, originally, it was fairly widely used. And I think part of the issue is if you have high-producing dairy cows, you have other issues if you boost them even higher. Um, when I've talked to Mar our dairy manager on campus, he said he likes to use it for a very brief time to help uh, control energy balance when he's trying to get cows pregnant, but he doesn't see the need to use it as a method to produce production. And so I think the consumer backlash actually is what really probably limited the, the adoption. But at one point it was fairly widely adopted if you looked at the amount of sales of the product. Uh, but I would say that it's not very widely used today. But I think that's because there's, 
and, and all, anybody who's in agriculture knows this, particularly on the animal side, there's a lot of things, uh, and even on the plant side, where you can improve things with management, you can improve things with nutrition, you can improve things by, there's a lot of different ways to, to get to a result. And with the increasing milk production through selection, I think the need for uh, RBGH, which was not shown to have any health issues for humans. Well, it's not seen, but the American Cancer Society opposed its uh, approval. They did. Uh, and, um, and it took three panels at FDA to get it approved. The first two who said no were fired and then brought in a, um, an executive from Monsanto to lead the group to, to get approval. Right. And, I and agree so with you. Um, that is, I think, part of the concern about these technologies is that it's confusing to, to the consumer. And some technology, maybe like the bovine growth hormone, um, has opposition, has some concern, and yet the industry pushes it and gets it approved. And, and then some may be more benign, and industry um, pushes it and gets it approved, and, and consumers don't know how to cut that, and, and maybe just say, you know what, I just am going to say no because I can't make the decision when industry or science or science or I would say um, yes, science is pushing a um, pushing a product for whatever reason. And uh, and when they're um, saying, well, you get the uh, you get no, the I point. Don't, I don't disagree with you. I think um, things get over oversold. There's no question that Monsanto did a very poor job when they first brought out <coughs> uh, recombinant uh, products. And I think probably because they weren't even thinking about the consumer, they were thinking about the grower, and they weren't thinking about the consumer. I think one of the problems that we have, and I think, again, having been in this realm now for almost 40 years, is that when we, when we blanket distrust science, it leads to the distrust of our, of our um, government organizations that are there to keep us safe. And so when FDA is there to protect our food supply, as is the USDA, and if we undermine the confidence in them, then we have problems across the board. Is science 100% accurate? No. Uh, science always is revising its opinion based on the newest data. But they do try. And I would argue, I don't, I don't know of any instance, even with BGH, where they set out to push a product that wasn't safe, and again, from what I'm aware of on the, on the recombinant side. Um, but it did meet with opposition, and I think partly, and partly they did. They didn't call it bovine growth hormone because they didn't want to say they were putting in a hormone. And yet, bovine growth hormone cannot interact with your growth hormone receptor, so it's not like it has an impact. It's not that it was unsafe, but they did. So I do think there are issues, and to the extent that they undermine trust and confidence, it does hurt. And then it hurts adopting things which are useful. So when does... Um science or regulatory, the regulatory and the science that goes to engage or approve uh, th this technology affected by money and politics. Um, and when is it not? I would say often the scientists in the room will say, I'm not affected by money and I'm not affected by politics. It's pure. Um, and and is anything pure in this? I mean, there's no question, politics. I think what you're looking at in the opposition movement is largely political and largely about making money. And, and as is Monsanto in selling uh, GMO. And when you ask, when you ask, when I ask my students on campus who owns Monsanto, most of them don't realize it's their parents' retirement. Their parents own Monsanto and that Monsanto has a responsibility to make money. So I, there, there, is this, there is this push and pull. But, at the, but I think when the, the regulatory agency should be trying to operate as pure as possible on facts and on, on, on risk, risk-benefit analysis, again, no scientist is ever going to come out and say there's no risk to anything. Right? There's a risk of an earthquake today. There's a risk of getting hit by a bus when you step out onto N Street. 
there's always a risk. And so one of the issues that you see with the opposition movement, and I took some notes when Josh was speaking from some of the things that I would question, um, they sometimes don't want there to be any risk. And I, and I would argue that non-GMO verified, which I have no problem with, is a marketing organization. It's marketing. It's selling a service, and it's convinced people to pay them money for them, and God bless them, that's what capitalism is. Um, they can't actually show where there's any scientific risk because there's not been any proven adverse reaction to an animal eating genetically engineered plants, to my knowledge, anywhere in the world. That's been documented. Human or animal, either way. Well, thank you for letting me engage you in that discussion, Dr. Murray. I'm sorry if it uh, with you creates a, uh, an issue there. <laughs> All right. Well, go ahead, Nancy. We'll, we'll <laughs> I just have a question about that. Uh, we hear about the fact that there aren't any studies that have proven, um, you know, problems, but we never hear about what the studies are. So I just question, you know, who's doing the studies, how many of them have been done, and... Well, Allison, and I don't, I can't give you chapter and verse, Allison cited a, uh, did an analysis of, of a lot of studies done on animals eating genetically engineered, which is published in the Journal of Animal Science. And so that's a meta-analysis because, again, as a scientist, I would not like to see a single study. I think the issue, when, when the GMO debate started around 1989, 90, somewhere in there, which was about eight or ten years after we were doing this, um, there was a lot of things, well, there had been no feeding trials that, that this was safe. Well, now there's a lot of feeding trials, but they're short-term. And so now they've gone back to say, well, there's no long-term feeding trials. On the other hand, unless you are eating organic and, and, and non-GMO verified and have eaten that all your life, everybody in this room has eaten GMO because about 90% of the non-GMO verified products in the United States would have some GMO in them. And all of your cattle and all of your fish and all of your chickens have been eating GMO corn. And, and there's no documented human illness ever been attributed to GMO. And part of the problem is, if you define it as the DNA, nobody's ever going to react to DNA. It's if there is a protein product in that that is either allergenic or toxic or something that you would have an adverse reaction. And that just hasn't been demonstrated. Not saying it won't ever occur. Well, well just to follow up, uh, we made the point when we were talking about the plants that there are so many factors that it's hard to single out what may or may not be causal. And so if we could point to asthma going, asthma rates going up. You sure can. You know, so we don't really know if that's a GMO or a GE issue or not. We just assume that there's too many factors to try to figure it out. So I just... I, that, that's true, but I would caution. And one of the things, and, and again, um, one of the things, and remember I've been debating uh, people for years on this. Um, if you look at the statistics for, say, autism, and you run a correlation between the introduction of GMO crops and the increase in autism in the mid-1990s, and they just go up, right? Okay. If I do that same analysis with the introduction of this in autism, it goes up. Anything that ABS breaks on your car. So correlations don't make causation. And so when you think there's a problem, you have to break it down and study those factors. And to the extent that people have looked, and there's been a lot of research done, nobody has yet found a causal link between a health problem in an animal or humans and any specific GMO. And, and again, that's just where the data's at. Might change tomorrow, might be some new papers come out, but so far it hasn't changed. Very good. We'd like to thank you for your presentation and, uh, and sticking with us on the questions here. Thanks again. Thanks, and, and you always know where to find us. You're always welcome to come across the causeway and, and see us. <laughs> or invite us over here and we'll come to you. <laughs> no, thank you. That's a good way to wrap up.
Okay, uh, Josh, we uh, oh. Re uh, board report on uh, yeah, so reporting real quick, and training. I already know what that is. It's bad. No. Um, so I put a list in everyone's folder. So um, basically a reminder that Form 700s are due April 1st. You have a link that has been sent to your email in regards to filling that out. That's the annual notification. I apologize about our system. Um, it's gone kind of crazy, and I know that you, everyone's getting a lot of notifications saying you're behind, your deadline, et cetera. This is the correct deadline, April 1st. Um, in addition to that, we are required ethics That's training. Not a joke. April first. April first is not a joke. That's not a real joke. deal. And then um, we also have the ethics um, requirement as well, and that information is also on this page. Um, a majority of us will be um, out of compliance within the next couple of months. It needs to be renewed every two years. There's only three of us that are in the green. Frank. <laughs> That's just yes. because he's new. So the, I don't So the sections that are outlined are the only ones you need to do? No, you need to do those additional ones. Yes. So there is a requirement that to be a valid certificate, we need to, and be in compliance with AB 1234, those additional ones you need to select as part of your training when you go through as well. I will send a reminder via email, but just to let you know, we need to take ethics training, and Form 700s are due on the 1st. These are what's officially on record. I can double check. Yeah, go ahead. So are we on So to my knowledge, and I will correct this in an email if I'm wrong. Um, so the Form 700, um, as a board, um, I think they are transitioning us to the main state system with FPPC versus with CDFA. And last year we were with CDFA, and I think that login is still saying that we'll be in CDFA this year, but I'll verify that. Will because they, you'll get, yes. Will they transfer the information? Yes, they will the transfer the information. It all goes to the same place. It's just who the report. Yes, so in theory, if you go to the CDFA link, all your additional requirements, reporting requirements, you might be able to put on there as well and duplicate them. So if you have to report for several agencies, there should be that ability. I'll double check right. on that. Right. A lot. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, board discussion. Any recommendations from this meeting the board would like to put forward? Bryce? Uh, at CDFA, we have a, um, a California Organic um, Product, uh, COPAC, California Organic Product Advisory Committee. And um, has COPAC taken this issue up? as far as this technology uh, relative to organic uh, production in California. I, I was just wondering if, um, if we could check on that and, and see if we would want to get a recommendation from them or an engagement uh, from them if, as far as the, um, uh, or maybe it's just a given um, under NOSB um, and that COPAC won't take this up or doesn't need to take it up. So, um that's a good question. So, COPAC, I think it was three or four years ago, they started a pilot testing on GMO products in, in organic, very similar to what That's they do right. for testing of, of pesticide residue. Um, and so they did a pilot test about two years ago, um, based in those results, it was double blind, um, and then are doing another one this year. Um, they actually just released that, um, or our staff and our lab just released those reports results to COPAC at the January meeting um, just a couple weeks ago at EcoFarm. Um, and I think overall they gave me the, the information here just in case we got that question. See, you were right on it, Bryce. Um, today we've collected 75 samples um, and phase one of the pilot had 45 samples and then the current phase two has 30 samples. 
Um, we've seen a pretty low prevalence in that testing, um, but that is something that COPAC is being mindful of and thinking about um, as far as, as testing um, more as verification for organic standards and product verification. So they are aware of it. And But as far as a policy statement or policy issue, no. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering, we're, we track the federal, right? And, um, Correct. And so there really isn't a discussion we need to have at COPAC uh, regarding this technology and its um, acceptance um, because we track federal. And whatever right, the federal right. says, we do here in California. So. Right, exactly. And I would say the federal still would, still waiting for guidance from USDA because it's still just, there isn't any regulatory on that. Okay, uh, our last uh, item will be public comment. Uh, if you'd like to address the board, we have uh, accepted the microphone, introduce yourself, and uh, we limit the comments to three minutes. Okay. So please, please try to keep it there. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. This has been an excellent discussion, and I appreciate all of the um, really critical questions you all have been asking. Uh, my name is Dana Pearls, and I am the senior campaigner of Friends of the Earth U.S., which is the North American arm of one of the largest environmental networks um, in the world. And I am uh, pleased to comment to the CDFA about some of the potential threats of gene editing to California's organic agricultural industry. Um, despite the claims that we have, may have heard today of precision and potential benefits of genetic engineering techniques like CRISPR, um, the scientific research has been fairly clear that there is in fact a high cert uncertainty um, and number of risks posed by gene editing. Um, there's a report that it looks like is being passed around that should just be the executive summary, which is ultimately a literature review of nearly 180 studies looking at the unintended consequences, mutations from gene edited plants for uh, agriculture. Uh, so please feel free to take a look. Um, in light of the risks, Friends of the Earth recommends a precautionary approach, one which is process oriented. I, I know that we've been discussing a little bit of that today, um, and which assesses and addresses the direct and indirect impacts and risks throughout the whole life cycle of genetic engineering production. These biosafety issues should be fully evaluated before environmental or commercial releases. Meanwhile, we have environmentally and economically sustainable solutions, organic and non-GMO agriculture. Organic sales in the US totaled a new record of $49.4 billion in 2017, which is up 6.4% from the previous year. Counties with high levels of organic agriculture activity lowers a county's poverty rate by as much as 1.35 percentage points. And organic has been said to create an estimated 407 uh, 1,400 jobs in California alone, many of which are more full-time and year-round employment opportunities for farm workers. Additionally, in the face of climate change, studies show that organic agriculture can minimize environmental harms such as loss of biodiversity, soil erosion, and water contamination. I would suggest that gene editing is a risk to organic and non-GMO agriculture. And when I say non-GMO, I am including gene editing um, in the definition of genetic engineering. So non-GMO would mean non-gene edited as well. Um, we heard from the non-GMO project. We also know that um, this isn't allowed, the gene editing is not allowed in, in, in European standards on, on genetic engineering. And I would argue that we have virtually no regulations that are adequate for these new technologies such as gene editing in the US. Um, and in the likely case of cross-contamination, this could put California's extensive organic exports to places like the EU at great risk, not to mention our own ecosystems. So I just would offer that we need to protect California's organic agricultural market 
our farmers, our processors from the impacts of gene editing. And until there is more science, robust health and environmental assessments, regulations, transparent testing, and clear labeling, there should be a pause on releasing new genetically engineered organisms, such as gene edited organisms, into the environment or onto the market. Um, and I would like to invite members of the CDFA to learn more about this topic and ask that the use of emerging genetic technologies in agriculture agriculture be evaluated for its impacts on organic agriculture, particularly in California, which is a growing and very profitable sector of California's food system. Um, I would also support the suggestion that was just made, which is that there be a coordinated conversation between the CDFA, the California Organic Program, and COPAC to address these concerns, potential assessments, regulations, and developments, regardless of whether Organic would allow gene editing. It's something which will affect the organic industry writ large. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Good afternoon. And uh, Don, I thank you for the last meeting, for your deference, for some folks that probably used their whole year of public comments, but maybe a little long, not quite a year of comments. But, um, this week is a Black History Month. Yesterday was Rosa Parks Day. It's been kind of an interesting kickoff. You know, I usually don't get sick till the middle of Black History Month because I just run myself ragged. But um, this year, the largest black expo is, is 31 years. This year is going to feature agriculture. After 31 years at Cal Expo with the farm in the back, we're going to feature uh, agriculture. And so I want to wel welcome you out there. Josh uh, sent the email to you. I encourage the, uh, I just sent it. I mean, just like, you know, because I went out, I was, I was begging him. I was like, you're right across the street. Walk across the street. The, uh, the CEO, founder of uh, Black Expo, he's right across the street. I said, <laughs> anyway, I, I encourage you to come. And I'll send some information and, and, and we'll highlight it. Next year, I want to bring a little piece of the World Ag Expo to Cal Expo. Imagine that. Uh, and then highlight what California is doing, how we can. Uh, be black and farm in California again, and then how we could share this to the world. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, we'll have we'll, we'll have a quiz. We're going to have a quiz after this. <laughs> I, I hope everybody took good notes. Uh, I feel like I've been back in school today, but I uh, really appreciated the program and and uh, really the uh, perspectives on. Uh, gene editing and biotechnology. So, Don, you, you have a yes. Go right ahead. Um, I'd like to call a water uh, committee subcommittee meeting in the next couple of weeks. Um, we have a new governor, and um, we probably ought to go through some of the policies or, or that we or positions that we've taken. Um, and so, I'll work with Josh. I I talked to Don earlier that that we probably ought to conference with the secretary before we have the meeting just so we understand but but there are some real pressing water issues that that we need to to address so um, we'll get that scheduled very good thank you Don okay we are oh sorry Bryce I'm not gonna pull the plug on you well, sorry. thank you uh, Don I just wanted to say that I just brought this product from Sierra Nevada it is called resilience and, and it was uh, produced uh, in response to the uh, Butte County fires. And uh, I would just say as a uh, resident of uh, Butte County um, that uh, there is significant um, a response, and the response still is significant to uh, in Butte County, uh, and, uh, and that if uh, CDFA um, were, were able to, um, to lend um, or continues to lend support and... Uh, and, and um, Governor Newsom's administration to the um, effort to uh, to uh, respond and to, then to rebuild uh, the, the town of, of Paradise and, and the town of Megalia and, and the town of, um, um, of other other towns that were significantly impacted by the fire and, and I would like to contribute this to uh, to the CDFA staff uh, for your enjoyment. <laughs> Very good. Bryce and yeah, the devastation up there was unbelievable, and my heart goes out to well, all the people. That well, not unlike family. Sonoma, right? And uh, and I just uh, appreciate the, the focus on on Sonoma and um, and what Sonoma has done in, in response, and uh, oh, right, and, and, and not unlike uh, what's happened in Shasta, 
and Mendocino and uh, and, and, and uh, Santa Barbara and and um, Malibu. Yeah, exactly. No, you're right. We had a lot of devastation throughout the state. So thank you. Thank you. All right, we're adjourned. Good to see everyone. We'll see you uh, next month.